morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where in the world you are. And welcome to the first TK show of the year, 2022. And we started off with a, a bit of a maverick, uh, as I'd call her, Miss Lise Ngobozi, who will be joining us uh, today. Uh, very interesting. I think before we just intro introduce Lise, that when you actually Google her, the first thing that comes under her is it says Lise Ngobozi, author. So uh, it's uh, we have someone who Google recognizes an author. So Lisha, welcome to the TK Show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I mean, before you used to get these must fall, so I'm glad I've rebranded as an author now. <laughs> no, no, that, that's very good. And I think you actually touched on, on a good place because you, I was almost going to say, you've got long struggle credentials post 1994 <laughs> period. If you could just maybe just give us a, a bit of background as to where you come from, and also just how did you get involved in Fees Must Fall? Oof, um, I'm from Durban, born and bred, but I'm Kosa, so I am, people like saying I'm Kosa by blood, Zulu by culture, which is very weird. <laughs> but yeah, I'm from the Eastern Cape in a small little rural town called Emaikenemina. I don't think anybody knows where that is. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, grew up in Durban all my life, um, moved to Grahamstown for school um, in around 2010, right through to 2017. Um, I did my undergrad right through to my master's um, in politics um, and international relations. Oh, wow. um, back when I thought I'd be a diplomat or, you know, something really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> And then the political science slash um, political theory kind of gripped me. Um, and yeah, and now I'm in Joba at the School of Governance. Um, yeah, I never thought I'd be somebody that it would be interested in sort of public sector governance. That took me by surprise, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and fees must fall. Oof. Also, I just think I'm the kind of person where things just really happen by chance. So I really <laughs> wasn't expecting to be part of that kind of thing. Um, I just remember going to one meeting um, on the day that, what's his name? Tomani Makwele did the whole statue thing. Um, and then we formed a little, we revived a former uh, political organization at Rhodes, which was called the Black Student Movement. Um, so we revived that on that day, and then that just took a wave of its own. And Peace Miss Fall happened at Rhodes and Grahamstown. I was just, I just happened to be there, and I happened to be one of the people that were making a noise. And yeah, I got a few pictures out of it, which I liked. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were to write a memoir, I have some good um, archives to look through. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it just, it's one of those things that I believed in, I still believe in. So it really didn't take me by surprise that I'd be in the mix. Um, yeah, and that's that. So then you moved from uh, Rose University, that little, little university there in yeah. Etheny, and you're an author. How, yes. Just uh, if you could just marry the two for us, is it which what inspired what you always wanted to be an author, or when you got more into politics, the author bug bit you? Like I said, things happened to me by chance. Like I never sought out to be an author, I never thought I'd have a book. Um, so when I did the masters, um, I looked at this group of women, or rather, an organization called Umaniano. I'm sure a lot of us have seen them in the red uniform. Um, on the Sunday and Thursdays, and my master's topic was around looking through how the church offers Black women the site for citizenship, um, and how non-state forms of citizenship are just as critical and just as fundamental to people's recognition, um, and how people experience um, community, how they experience um, particular resources that are found within those spaces, and how they navigate um, non-state forms of citizenhood and the expression of that. Um, yeah, and so that was the masters. Um, two years down the line, um, I was I sent the masters to someone who was working, who is still working at um, Tafelberg. And I was like, hi, I have this stuff here. I don't know what to do with it. Do you think it's something that we could publish? 
And yeah, they said, sure, let's do it. And then I just had to rework it and published it. And that's that. So I never thought I'd be a published author, but I always just was somebody that enjoyed academic writing and thinking about particular things. And also moving away from political theory as a very serious state-centric kind of um, mm. area of study and being able to use those tools of analysis to make a lot of interventions within the micro interpersonal space that people navigate. And so um, trying to move away from politics being a state-centered understanding of how people negotiate different aspects of their lives with the state and how we can use those kinds of theoretical tools to understand any and everything really that's non-state related. Yeah, so for those that are looking for the book, can you just give us the full name again? Uh author Lise Ngobozi. Yeah, so the book is called, what's it called? Sorry. <laughs> Mothers, Woman, of the... Mothers of the Nation, Manyana Woman in South Africa. Um, it's available everywhere. Um, exclusives, loot, take a lot. All of those things. Yes, uh, please do go get it. Uh, royalties are always needed, so it's, it's always <laughs> great. No, but it's uh, then obviously you make the move, like you say, to governance. And uh, it's actually interesting that you mentioned a lot of non-state actors and issues of citizenship, which sort of kind of brings us into the year 2022 in terms of where the Republic is and also where world politics is going. And if you could just maybe, yeah, just paint a picture for us, just your understanding of where is the Republic or what is the state of South Africa as you best understand it as a political theorist, author, <laughs> maverick, political analyst? Wow. <laughs> I think, okay, firstly, within the globe, of course, we're, I think we're facing very, I hate when people say we're in very challenging times, but we are. Um, beyond just COVID-19, I think we were at a place where the global financial crisis was sort of creeping in again, and the sort of global austerity measures were also taking place um, and the South African government as well, although they will deny it, um, <laughs> there, were, there are a lot of austerity measures that are being introduced by the state because of the global financial crunch that we are, trying, we are experiencing. Uh, but what COVID-19 then did, it just exacerbated those um, moments of crisis, if you could call it that, or the moments of just deep um, uh, state require. So the moments where the state is now required to actually fundamentally work, <laughs> and this is what we're finding, that the state now is at the place globally where it actually has to function and that it needs to be able to marshal all of its resources um, in a way that is able to allocate these resources that, in a way that will enable people to have access to particular things. Um, that's just at the micro level. So if we're looking at the fiscus, the fiscus needs to be distributed in such a way that people will be able to have access to particular goods and services that are within the competencies of the state. Um, but beyond that, we also, I think particularly South Africa is having a governance crisis, um, which is not a new phenomenon. I don't think that we are seeing the, this crisis play out in a new way or a particularly um, unoriginal way. I think we've seen these particular things happening throughout the course of our democracy. But I think now in the context of COVID-19, the, co the context of just the global markets shrinking at the, at the rate at which they're shrinking at, uh, with now this new dynamic of the Ukraine-Russia conflict as well, we are finding South Africa in a very critical point. Um, if we look at it from a sort of international politics or international relations perspective, but in a far more domesticate, a domestic analysis is we are dealing with the state that is not able to make use of its institutions in a way that primarily benefits the citizen. Um, and we're finding that there is the inability of the state to fulfill its key mandate and its key governance mandates. And I know you're not, you don't believe in South Africa being a developmental state. <laughs> However, that's how they characterize themselves. So we are not seeing those developmental goals or that developmental orientation of the state actually playing through uh, to intangible ways. And um, I think South Africa is very progressive when it comes to policies, some of them, and that these policies, in terms of the objectives of them, you do see the intellectual thought or the 
um, line and logical reasoning of why particular policies are in existence, but we're not seeing that particular ex execution taking place. And there are a number of reasons, you know, corruption, um, capacity of, of, of the state in and of itself, um, the misalignment of human resources with critical yeah. institutions, um, and as well as the shrinking fiscus. Um, and that fiscus shrinking for a number of reasons and the draining of the fiscus as well. Um, so we're seeing a lot of things taking place at the same time. And also we're seeing, of course, the influence of factional politics um, being subsumed into the state and that playing a very critical role in how the state functions um, and how key entities within the state as well have become subject to factional politics. Um, so we have a number of things happening at the same time. Um, all of which you're also seeing the socioeconomic situation of individuals also yeah. deteriorating. Um, the, the consumption bucket of individuals has also shrunk considerably. Uh, people not being able to have access um, to particular goods and services and even the crunch of the seemingly or supposedly black middle class or the middle class in general, also as well their consumption drop, their consumption bucket at, at the household level shrinking considerably as well. So we have all of these contending mixed buckets of, of, of things happening at the same time that I am not sure if we will get out of it anytime soon. No, I think I like that overview. And maybe it just maybe drives me to ask the question <clears throat> for, like you said, for someone, uh, particularly a female, black female, who comes from that area, the Eastern Cape you speak of, what what does 2022 look looking for? Because if I had to listen and I think analyze everything you've given. It's almost as though there's a diminishing, uh, you know, opportunities for this young black woman who comes from a rural area in the Eastern Cape. Uh, I mean, you spoke about fees must fall as well. I mean, NASFAS, uh, the ability for the state to build human human capital through through NASFAS. Uh, would one be correct in saying that basically it's diminishing returns, especially for people who come from rural and township areas? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was at home um this December and I mean I've been going home every December but this year I just I last year rather I saw in very real terms um how the lack of good governance impacts people's lives and I've seen it before but I think now in my older years and somebody that has now been within this governance thinking pool that we're all part of you can tangibly see the ways that the inability of the state to function has critical impact on people's lives. Um, where I'm from, we still have the long drop system. Um, there's no, not a lot of people have water, people have electricity. Um, there are a lot of child headed households still. Um, the chances of people in my area finishing, uh, obtaining the national senior certificate is still something that is very, very, uncommon mm -hmm. um and so the i like what you call the diminishing returns of democracy that's what we're seeing play out um and in the eastern cape i think it's 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 far more intense than anyone could ever imagine i just think within my hometown there's no police station uh you have to go to town to get to the police station um, there's no uh, home affairs, home affairs is in town, you know, yes. um, to have access to what we call in Kram Kram, which is what social grant, you have to go do that in town. So the spatial geography as well is still very much the same mm -hmm. in the sense that to be able to have access to state resources as somebody living in the Eastern Cape or rural Eastern Cape, you still need to deal with that um, geographical uh, what's it? the how resources are also determined by where you are geographically and how you're located mm -hmm. and you have to then make um take particular journeys to just get to a police station to go get an affidavit to get your id to do all sorts of things and so the state is not because it's not getting any closer to the citizen especially if you mm -hmm. are within that particular area it's getting further and further away from the citizen and the citizen has to compensate from that out of their own pockets um as opposed to the state, fundamentally the state is supposed to bring itself closer to the citizen, right? 
Um, but that's not what happened within the Eastern Cape. Even with NASFIS, you know, um, the loopholes that people have to jump through specifically when you're within the Eastern Cape, it's, it, the resources that you need to have to actually get that application through, you know, it's not just about applying, but what you need to do to get that application through. Um, it's, very, it's very challenging for people within that particular area. And so the state in many ways is becoming more and more invisible to people that are on the outskirts mm -hmm. or the peripheries of sort of the, the, the economic hubs of South Africa. And the state is doing that at an increasingly, at an, an alarming rate um, if you're in the Eastern Cape um, or if you're in any rural area within the country that is as, um, what's the word? I hate underdeveloped, but that's just the, mm, <laughs> what yeah. we have to say. But um, if you're in that kind of um, socioeconomic context um, and that geographic location as well. So the state is really, really moving further and further away from the people who actually require it the most because people have the ability, if you're in the urban or economic hub of South Africa, you can outsource a lot of your stuff to the private sector, right? You can outsource um, your needs to the private sector because you have the economic need the economic and the, and the income available to you to do so. So when people don't have the ability to outsource to the private sector, what then happens to them? Um, in South Africa, we're seeing the more you don't have the ability to outsource, the further and further away the state becomes, um, the more the state becomes invisible or rather the state invisibilizes you further and further. Um, and so for me, that that is, that is something that we need to take very, very seriously as a people that is that are thinking about these kinds of things. No, 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 thank you for that. And I like the term you used, diminishing uh, returns of democracy. And I guess maybe the, the question which always pops up, I mean, it would be interesting for, for one to, have to ask it is, historically, if you look at what the, if we use the Eastern Cape as a microcosm of, let's say the non-metropole, which is your Joburg, Pretoria, Cape Town, even Durban existence, I mean, the, the history, it's it's quite rich, even educationally. I mean, I think there's St. Andrews, if I'm not mistaken, there's Gray, Gray High School, yeah. there's Rose University, NMMU. So the, I mean, Fort Hare, which I mean, its history speaks for itself, but there is a question that I mean, it always gets asked that, how is it that maybe the population, which obviously loves education, understands what education can do, rich struggle history, which I think it, maybe like to say consciousness for lack of a better word so how is it that the eastern cape has not been able i mean if you even look at its agricultural potential mm. how is it that this region i mean which maybe <clears throat> excuse me unlike a lot of areas you know th there's always that thing which says uh, especially for for africans within south africa say uh, how do you imagine a new future usually you, you, there's no graduates in the house but the eastern cape is one of those rare places where graduates are a dime a dozen and the history speaks to that so why is it this area is basically for lack of a better word it's a failed province yeah i i, I don't know i re, i wish i could answer that but also I, I mean we know that governments are not supposed to prioritize particular areas but in my mind the anc i mean the the eastern Cape fundamentally is was the anc's breeding ground for the intellectual muscle of the country. Um, and the Eastern Cape was very critical in shaping constitutional democracy in South Africa. Um, people debate that, but that's just my stance. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I, and I'm not saying that the state was supposed to prioritize the Eastern Cape, but I mean, if that was the space with which the, the critical ideas of constitutionalism, democracy, and all of that, and um, the history of institutions such as Lovedale and Forte, and you know, if that is where, in all for all intents and purposes, constitutional democracy was born, it only makes sense that you would try as much as you can to sort of plow back into that particular area. But also, given the fact that people still see the value in the Eastern Cape as an as the province, as well as it providing very critical thinkers, um, even in the post-democratic era, you know. If I look at a lot of analysts, most of, and I don't, I'm not saying this to be like an ethnic or whatever person, but to show that there's still value in these institutions that are in the Eastern mm -hmm. Cape. 
there's still value in um, roads, forte. Um, I saw some things about re revitalizing the Lovedale Press and all of that stuff. And so there's still deep historical value within those areas, but the government is not committed in, is not committed in um, sort of upscaling those particular areas. Um, even if you, like you said, in terms of agriculture, when I was home, the, the, the harvest was plenty, you know, the fields were green, they were lush, there was a lot of rain. Uh, and from a subsistence farming level, you know, people were able to um, provide for themselves from the soil which they inhabit. Um, and there's a lot of land in the Eastern Cape, you know, and most of those um, areas of land are being sold off by chiefs in that particular area. So the government is not even regulating the selling of land within that particular area because my aunt was telling me that, you know, they wanted extra land and all they had to do was go to the chief and write a note and pay however much they had to pay and the land was theirs. Um, and so that is happening there as well where people are actually redistributing land in ways that the government is supposed to be doing so, right? Um, and so there's, there's just no sense of idea of what we do with the Eastern Cape um, and where we take it and what is required of the state to be able to allocate funds, resources and human capacity to be able to think through how we deal with the Eastern Cape crisis in terms of education, in terms of just adequate basic services. Um, you know, somebody, when I was back home, we had the unfortunate incident of somebody <clears throat> experiencing GBV. And to actually drive to the police station from where the incident happened, took us around about an hour and a half. And when we got there, the police station was closed. You know, so those kinds of things in the everyday mm. that, you know, how the state is supposed to function and work in the everyday, for a lot of people within that area, that doesn't happen. Um, and so the government really needs to take seriously what, it, what, what is it wanting to do about that particular crisis? And I don't think there's much direction, if I'm being honest, in how to, to deal with that. No, I think that's a very interesting. Yeah, no, I think you actually narrated quite well. And maybe just ask the question now you're in Gauteng, are you seeing that the I think in your in the previous when we gave you the opening, you when you get you gave us a just a, a a narrative and a picture of what the state of the nation looks like. How far is the rest of South Africa? Because I know you said that look, if you live in Gauteng, there's certain things you can somewhat outsource to to the private sector. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you can't, uh, I always tell people there's a, I think there's a movie, Batman, I think the, the, the one where there's Catwoman, not the new one, yeah. uh, the one with, with Christian Bale, where she mm -hmm. says, listen, it cannot be that in a society only a few have, eventually those that don't have will ask the question, why can I not get that? So how far is the, what we term, I think the Eastern Cape condition from the rest of uh, South Africa? How, yeah. how long is it, or is it maybe a bit of a stretch to say, listen, Gauteng, Western Cape, parts of KZN will never really get to that, to where the Eastern Cape is. Yeah, I mean, I think there's pockets of it across the country. Um, there's pockets of that kind of deterioration and that kind of state dysfunction um, within pockets across the country. I mean, Cape Town, for example, that's a crime scene for me personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's happening in Cape Town is a crime scene. You just, if you land in Cape Town, it is the most devastating picture of what is happening in South Africa. We are seeing these lush green lawns and these long uh, Olympic pools and you know people are living this lavish lifestyle. And if you just turn to your right, you just see Kailicha and all these other informal settlements mm. that how, how is it possible that you have those two worlds existing simultaneously in the same, in less than about two, five, six kilometers from each other? And for me, that's a crime scene. It is a crime scene. And it's not just about the ANC, but it's also about the, just the broader understanding of governance in South Africa across political mm. groups and people that are responsible to be, to responsible for governance and then responsible to their electorate. Um, and they're just not, they're just not 
showing that ethic of, of responsibility and that ethic of care, because primarily governance is about exercising an ethic of care over the citizenry. Through then, of course, through then, of course, marshalling policies, frameworks, making use of your institutions and all of that. But if fundamentally, that is what the government is supposed to do. And then we're seeing that that's just that's just not happening. And it's across it's across the country, you know. In KZN, you know, if you go to rural areas like Mnambiti or even Mlaz, um, which is a township there, it's also it's also like that, right? There are pockets of it happening in South Africa, but I think because the Eastern Cape is just far more. I don't know. It's just it's just it's just yeah. I don't know, but I I just. I just think that South Africa is headed down a very, very strange and very, and I hate to say it's the African post-colonial condition, mm. but it is seemingly looking like this idea of South African exceptionalism is just not going to pay off and that we are headed down a very, very dangerous path. Um, and like you've said, we are, not everybody is going to be able to outsource key yeah. um, services. For example, ESCOM is hitting us all hard, right? Uh, but of course, to varying degrees, depending on how you fall on the economic and income ladder, but it's, it's, it's all hitting us, right? The inflation is hitting us all. The increase in fuel is hitting us all. Um, and we'll get to a point where not everybody will be able to outsource. And once we get, get to that point, I think that's when we will see something like KZN taking place or anything similar to that. No, no, so it's, it's an interesting point you raise, the, the issue of their pockets. And again, it speaks to what you said about the apartheid spatial planning. And mm. not, and I guess maybe the, the maybe a different way and a different way to ask this is, I like that you were able to link it to what tends to happen post-colonially and the issue of South African exceptionalism. Uh, but you know, there's always this argument, uh, I'm, I'm not a believer in it, that look, uh, the youth will take us forward. And, um, and uh, I think you are, younger than me by a considerable decade or so. <laughs> so the question is, where then are these, uh, obviously I'm not gonna ask you to make a commentary on each and every Fees Must Fall leader, but there, there is a question that needs to be asked. Where are the leaders who were able to say, listen, there is a problem within higher education, albeit it's a small group, uh, quite an elite one by virtue of being it. But the, the question of everything you've discussed seems to point to what you say, governance failure and governance failure and I like what you said, it's the ethics of care. And you would think that being a young person in South Africa, this does affect you a bit more than most yeah. of you. It's either your parent is on a grant of sort, or it's either you, if, like you said, single-headed household, you are facing the brunt of the problem. Or if you're a black female South African, unemployment is rife. You've talked about gender-based yeah. violence. So, so that, that does beg the question, where, where are the leaders? Uh, where are, where's this next generation? who are supposed yeah. to say, we see wrong. I think there are two things. One, and I'm gonna be very honest with you here, and I might get some backlash about what I'm about to say, but power is elusive, right? Everybody in many ways wants to have access to power. And I think the, 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 the pitfalls of fees must fall or rather the ways that power politics function is that the state will invariably absorb anyone that they, seem, they see as a threat to them. And so you'll see that fees must fall, a lot of key figures in fees must fall were absorbed into the state in one way or another, whether it's they were members of parliament, legislature, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and once you get absorbed into the structures, I think it's very, very difficult to then be as radical as you were when you were an outsider. Mm. Um, and so now when you're an insider, there's a code of conduct and there's a code of behavior that whether it's spoken or not, there's a line that you must walk. And I think, and I think that's what has happened um, on one level. And then on the second part, I also just think that for a lot of us, and I include myself, post fees must fall, I needed a job. <laughs> you know? I needed to finish my master's, I needed to work, I have family responsibilities, I, I, can't, I can't be an activist all my life, unfortunately. I can't be, you know, on the streets. I, I just, I just, it just wasn't a, 
a solution for me because life needs to go on, you know? I need to, I have stuff to do. And I think that's what South Africa does to you if you're a young person. It makes you, mm. it requires you to make that trade-off between are you going to be invested in activist politics or are you going to do the survival thing? Um, and I think a lot of us were caught in that kind of um, trade-off that we had to make. Um, because a critique I've seen is like all the fees must fall leaders are now either in parliament or some of them are lecturers at the very same institutions that we were, you know, burning things in or whatever the case may be. And it's a, it's a fair and adequate critique, but also what, what do we want people to do? You know, there's no incentive in being an activist monetarily, especially if you have responsibilities. Um, and unfortunately, that's how the South African state works is that you need money to live and you need an income to live. Um, but I also think an added part of that is co consumption culture in South Africa is at a very intense level. <laughs> um, the culture of consumption, and I know you're not an Instagrammer, but the culture of Instagram <laughs> and the culture of ostentatious displays of wealth, even if you don't have it, but that display of being able to have an LV bag, being seen to be eating at these places or whatever. It also plays a role in what people actually want. It shapes people's wants and needs, and it also shapes what they are willing to concede on and what they are not willing to concede on. So if I'm able to secure my bag, I'm able to you know, get my money up, as people say, I'm not going to be preoccupied with things of, of, of the state or government or whatever. You'll find me tweeting about it and be like, oh, as ESCOM, this is horrible. Mm. It's horrible. But as a citizen, I'm not going to actively engage with that because that's not my priority. My priority is being able to consume and also to display my levels of consumption because that is what we are seeing as the, the, the currency of interaction between people, specifically for young people as well. And so that consumption culture, I think, does a lot to lull the mind and to lull the brain around issues of governance and politics and the state and state dysfunctionality because you're just preoccupied with consumption and displaying that consumption and the currency and the social capital that comes with that far more outweighs you being somebody that's interested in the critical issues of today. Uh, and so we're finding ourselves in that very weird situation as young people. No, it's, uh, uh, since you've exposed me as not doing Instagram, you're going to expose me again. What's an LV? <laughs> Louis Vuitton, sorry. <laughs> me Kalpa. Oh, wow. Okay. No, but I, I, like, I like the way you, you've swerved it because maybe sometimes when we... Look, there, there is a question uh, that always gets asked about the youth and I like the way that you've answered it. But maybe this culture... W w eventually, cultures become norms and standards of how society lives and works. So is it maybe a stretch to say if you are X individual living in, I think as like you said, that this consumer mindset, it would be, I think the NBA players call it getting your letters. I think it, it's getting yeah. your money. That, that, that's yeah. a terminology they use. Uh, so how much of a stretch is to say getting your letters could even mean, look, if Lutle suffers in the process of me having to basically get a tender here and there, but yeah. hey, look, it's just Lutle and her people that they, they're used to suffering. Is that yeah. too much of a stretch of imagination or does it eventually say, listen, you are meaning, you're willing to be anything and everything to get your letters or your LVs, as you put it? Yeah, definitely. I think, and the thing people also do is that they think that corruption is just a state thing, that it just exists there mm. and it's just government doing things that we don't believe in and have unethical practices. And we as a people don't engage in that kind of behavior. But you just have to see the kind of, so there's this rise of internet scammers, right? <laughs> um, specifically on Instagram, social media, these forex traders or whatever. And all of that is based on how do I get my bread or get the letters as you're saying. And people are doing that via scamming people because also that's mm -hmm. the template that government has now set for us that if you want to be successful as a black person in South Africa now, um, if you want to be successful, if you want to have money, if you want to be seen as somebody that 
is worth anybody's time, cash is king. And to do that, you need to do that in any way possible, even if it means you are screwing the other person over. But as long as you get your lettuce and you get your bread, then that's what you're going to, to, going to do. Because the government has also set that template for people as well. And that there are very minimal consequences when you engage in that kind of behavior. And so mm. that's what people are also doing now to say, you know, I will be a scammer. I will do all sorts of things to get this bag or get this bread. Um, but I also think it's a very, what I'm saying is speaking to a very specific demographic of, of people. Mm. So is I'm not saying um, generally that's what the, the youth or younger people are doing, but within a certain tax bracket, that's what people are doing. What's happening for young, unemployed, black, black South Africans who, you know, prospects are very, very low. The chances of them actually getting a job are close to zero. You know, they, 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 they live off a grant of some kind. They're part of the informal sector or the informal economy. Those are the people that are actually experiencing the, 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 the brunt of the youth not actually the youth that actually has the capacity to have the voice and to be taken seriously, mm. those the people underneath that bracket are the ones that are actually suffering from us not actually engaging in politics in the way that we should be. Because fundamentally in South Africa, for you to be actually heard, you need to be within a particular bracket. Um, so electricity can go off as a way to for two, three, four weeks, you know, and nothing happens. You know, there'll be no uproar. But if that happens in Santon, or in, I don't know, other areas, sorry. <laughs> Constantia. <laughs> or, in or in Midrand or wherever, you know, people live, there's going to be an uproar because of the social capital that comes with you being located within a particular area. So it is incumbent on people that are recognized by the state to do that heavy lifting work on behalf of the people that aren't. And so if that layer does not engage in that kind of work, it's, it's, it's very difficult for the layer beneath them to, mm. to, to be heard or to be considered as people that are actually worth listening to, which is what I found very interesting about the KZN issue. Um, although there are a lot of things at play, but fundamentally we really saw a very, um, on a mass level, um, people that wouldn't ordinarily be heard actually put, bringing the country to its knees. And I'm not sure if that is what is required. Um, I mean, I hope not because, you know, I still want to live in South Africa. <laughs> but if that is what is required, then we're in serious trouble. Because um, people living in Santon, they were tweeting about it. People are living in Midrand were tweeting about it. Being like, oh my gosh, why is everybody looting? Why is everybody stealing? Whereas the ones that were actually doing that, whether you think it was right or wrong, there are reasons for that. And there are reasons mm. why people decide to wake up in the morning and go steal a TV. I mean, or go steal, I don't know, that people, whatever people were looting. So I think that lack of interclass conversations and integration, specifically where young people are concerned, um, is probably one of the things that is actually just another crisis that we're not really thinking about. No, no, I think that the key point I take, what you said, locality is now capital, which I guess yeah. is maybe a build up from what you said about the party spatial planning, that if you live in Constantia, if you live in certain areas within Gauteng, your voice is more magnified than others. But mm-hmm. like, I like, but I think what you're raising is, just, is how sustainable is this model? Uh, I think you earlier on painted the issue that, look, the fiscus is diminishing, which speaks about uh, tax base is shrinking, and we... We literally cannot afford to be taxed anymore, as you said. Yeah. We, we all have responsibilities. And, but it would just seem the state does not have that understanding and they would, they would literally tax more. So uh, this, the sustainability of this model, and uh, I think you partially touched on it, uh, how do you actually make the powers that be to listen? Because I think you're raising a key issue that, that this model is not sustainable going forward. I mean, it's not sustainable where... And it's laughable. <laughs> you and I are part of the top 1% in relation to education, in relation to, if we're looking at black people now, uh, we're not looking at the billionaires and all of this. <laughs> Talking about as just based, not basic, but professionals, young professionals who are educated, who have multiple degrees, 
who um, you know, have a steady stream of income and all of that stuff. You and I are part of the top bracket in South Africa. And that's scary because mm. my life doesn't say I'm, I'm, I'm that top 1%. It doesn't because I, 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 if you compare me then to, you know, the top 1% specifically around white South Africans, the picture is fundamentally different. Yeah. It's very, very different. So my 1% compared to Jonathan's top 1%, very, very different things. Um, and so that, first of all, is just unsustainable. That race still very much um, places you within a particular bracket in society. Um, and that the rankings uh, are still very much determined by race. Um, and sure, we have a few black people here and there, but that doesn't fundamentally change the structure of how race functions in South Africa and how it functions specifically mm. around income, the economy, and who the service and who the who the economy is servicing and who is participating in the economy. Because those are two different things. If the service, if the economy is servicing you as somebody that owns the means of production, you have access to that economy in ways that are fundamentally different from me, who's just a participant. Because all I do, I go to work, I offer my skills, I get a salary, and that's that. In terms of owning the means of production, in terms of making very critical. Um, economic interventions around industry, manufacturing, all of that stuff. I am nowhere near those conversations. And I don't think mm -hmm. I will be part of those conversations anytime soon. Um, and so that model for me is fundamentally just the, one of the crises that we're facing. But then the added layer then becomes, if we're looking at Black people specifically, the, the stratification levels are just too high. <laughs> like, it, it just cannot be that I'm the top 1% when even in my own family, there's somebody that's probably in the lower percentile, but we come from the same family. We're probably the same generation. We, you know, our, our relations are pretty close in terms of the family lineage. Like we could be siblings. Mm. And we're experiencing the world very, very differently. And I just don't see, that is just not sustainable. And when the state then is supposed to intervene within those discrepancies, the state is not doing so. And so that gap of stratification is not shrinking. If anything, for Black people, it's increasing. Um, and it's increasing at a rate where something's going to explode at some point. Um, and the state is not actually, I think they know this, they're very aware because they're very smart people working and they have analysts, actuaries and all of those things. And they have models that can tell you exactly what the issue is. But I'm not sure what is the, the glitch in the system. You know, I'm not mm. sure that thing that, 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 that needs the cog in the machine that is just not, you know, doing the things that, that, that are meant to be. And I don't know what that is. And I think we can theorize that, say all sorts of things, but if there's no willingness on, part, willingness on the part of the state to actually exercise an ethic of care, I, I'm not sure where, 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 where we're going to go because I don't even think the alternative is another party because we've seen how different parties govern within different areas in the country. And we're seeing the same template play out um, beyond just historical legacies of apartheid. But mm. even in the contemporary democratic dispensation, we are still seeing those kinds of um, stratification levels increasing despite whichever and party is, is is presiding over whichever province local government whatever the case may be so i'm not sure if it is an anc problem but i also think it's a, it's bigger than the anc as well no 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 i think i, I like that and it maybe brings the issue because i think uh, what's always been said is that uh, the analysis i have to say i think it was is quite sharp in telling but you know uh, I'm one of those, I do love hope. <laughs> uh, the changing of this, are, are we, I think maybe using this conversation, are we then saying that we literally need to wait for this generation to disappear, whatever that means? Yeah. And But again, we've just also spoken about the, the, the forthcoming generation and it doesn't also, like you said, there's norms and rules and mm -hmm. this is a super structure. <laughs> Where do you go? Because like, we, we, like you said, it's not sustainable. But the, the key question is, do you see any, anything, anyone or any grouping that really seems to want to change the status quo 
if only just to be able to say, listen, let let's like you said, let's 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 maybe share the lettuce a bit more. Let's uh, yeah. put in this issue of ethics of care within yeah. governance. Give us some level of hope to have to look after before, because I don't want to go to New Zealand. I, I I'm already <laughs> light. I, I cannot afford to be lighter than this. I don't know. I think if we're looking at the public sector, I don't think people actually want to work there. <laughs> Because if we're going to revive institutions, you need people that are going to be in the institution. Like mm. you can't revive, you can't deal with state capacity issues outside of the state. Like it, it, that's not how it works. Like you can collaborate, you can do all sorts of things. You can outsource particular competencies to the private sector. You can outsource projects. You can outsource skills and all of that stuff. But fundamentally, if you're wanting to transform the state via its institutions, you need people to be in those institutions and to work in those institutions. But people don't want to do that. <laughs> like yeah. people would rather come in as consultants, do that one project and then leave because of this of the dysfunction that's that's taking place in government. Or people want to come in at DG level or at, I don't know, whatever those levels are. Um, and that's the only time you're invested in going into government. And even when you're going into government, you're not going there because you actually believe in transforming the space, but you understand that government pays. <laughs> and I'm mm. thinking that government pays well. And so you are there to increase your tax bracket. And you're not really there because you actually believe in being there. Um, and I'm also at fault at that because a lot of people have asked me, Lisa, you really are into this kind of stuff. Why aren't you in government? And I'm just like, have you seen what's going on in there? <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> have you seen what's happening? You know, I'd be frustrated to no end. Um, and so there's no benefit. It doesn't seem like there's a, mm. there's a personal benefit of you actually engaging in that space as somebody that's very, very interested in being there. But beyond that, the red tape that exists within the state is just, you know, the, the politics within institutions, because institutions are seemingly these independent bodies that, you know, are not um, influenced by any sort of external political contestations or any sort of political alignment. And they're just these vehicles of um, state structures that are meant to live out the, 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 the policies and practices of the incumbent, of course. But that's not true. <laughs> like, there's a lot of mm -hmm. politics in there. There's a lot of factionalism that is in there. You know, people die for positions. You know, it's just the 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 level of dysfunction is just so bad that even wanting to engage, you get scared. You know, in some corrupt thing unknowingly, because that's how easily mm. it happens. You know, you un unknowingly get caught up in something. Next thing, you're at state capture, accounting for something that we didn't even realize you were part of. And I'm not saying that the private sector doesn't have these issues, of course they do. But if we're wanting to think about the capacities of the state and institutions, the state is where you, are need, you have to build those competencies. And so I'm not sure how much of an incentive there is for people to go into that space and to also not be met with high levels of resistance because when that's what happens all the time, you know? Um, you could be innovative, you could come up with new ideas. I have people that work in government and the main thing that they say is that the resistance is just, the resistance to change is, is so high that you even get despondent as somebody that works there. And so you just collect your ticket. Mm. And so I'm not sure, man, it's just, I don't know. I wish I could just switch off and just press a reset button, you know, and then just build the thing again, but we can't do that. Um, but I do think that if we want to change in any way, you have to be in the trenches and you have to, you just have to be there in your own space, in your own little world. It might not mean anything in the next five, 10 years, but if you build a system long enough within the next 15, 20, 30, maybe you'll see a turnaround. Maybe you'll see, um, the returns be far more beneficial than what it is at the moment, but just go there, TV, go, go with the government. <laughs> was the, I was in government. I'm good. I'm good, right? But I, I, maybe I just want to push back and maybe 
I challenge you because I think you use an interesting word, this reset button. Mm. What would it look like? Look, if because I think from what you're saying, it really, if all logic is to be believed, he can only do it via reset. Because mm. incrementalism against a unsustainable the man, let's say the manner in which the state is unsustainable, you're not really little one, two, three changes are not going to work. So you're right in saying a reset. But if one had to push you on saying, okay, Alicia, we do need a reset, what, what would it look like? Because I think from based on this discussion, I think that's what really is needed. But if you had to be given a, a magic, uh, if you had to be given that power, that Putin type of power to, yeah. to use a, a Fox Pass, how, what does this reset look like? In truth, if it had to be as brutal as you want. For me, I would, first of all, do an audit of who is there, what are they doing, what are they bringing to the table. Um, a skills audit. Because I think fundamentally, the problem, one of the major problems is the skill set. We just, for example, just something basic like going to home affairs. It shouldn't take that long. You shouldn't have to wake up at 4 a.m. to go queue and only to be attended to at 12 or 1. And even when you get to the front, someone will say, sorry, 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 system of land. Like those things are not supposed to happen. Sure, they can every now and then, sure, there are glitches, but that should not be the day-to-day -day running of those kinds of uh, people facing services. So things also like public access to access to public health care. No one should be waking up at 3 a.m. to queue to see the one doctor that arrives once a month to check on people and servicing a population of around thousands and thousands. That's not supposed to happen. You know, there, are, there should be systems in place that say, if you have an appointment, you are there at this time, you'll be seen at this time, and this is what you'll get. You'll see the doctor again in two weeks. And that for me is just the regularity of good service for me is what we mm. don't get. And because we don't prioritize customer service at a public, public services level, people, and also because of the type of customer that the public service is, is servicing, people don't take those people seriously. So if you had to go to Milk Park, chances are of you getting there at 4 a.m. and only being seen at five in the evening or at half past four, that's very rare. Mm. Because there are systems in place, there is, there are just the way that thing run, the way things run and function is that there is a system. And because we understand the consumer as somebody that is paying, we then treat them in a particular way. And in the public service, that doesn't happen, specifically when it comes to just public services like healthcare, education, water, and all of that stuff. But on a higher level, I think a skills audit within key institutions, like for example, the Department of Social Development, can you tell me what's going on there? No. Who's, even, who's even the minister? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You don't know that. The Department of Women, Children, don't, 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 don't. don't. Even then you don't know. And we have a GBV crisis in South Africa and activists have played their part, right? They've pushed the government to act in particular ways, but the department itself doesn't know how to handle the crisis. Mm. Um, we have the, what's the, the commissioner of police, whatever. No. I don't know what, yeah. The police system in South Africa, it's just, it doesn't work. It doesn't function. And it's not because, most of it is because the skills are just not there and people are just being hired by basis of you knowing somebody you go through that training program which i think is like five days or five weeks you emerge out of that as a police officer but you don't know how to deal with gbv cases you don't know how to deal with the psychosocial dimensions of people being traumatized by acts of violence like there's just that kind of stuff just doesn't happen in south africa you know and so a skills audit firstly just to revamp you know um, the kinds of skills that are present in the public sector. Um, Does this include also, getting rid of unions in your research? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. But I'm talking about public facing institutions in South Africa just don't do what they're meant to do. Um, and also just, I don't know, man. And also maybe my question is, my answer is also about 
what is the actual problem? Is it a skills problem? Is it an execution problem? Is it the state not knowing what to do, how to do it? Is it a poor evidence-based research problem? Is it a, 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 a resource problem in terms of financing? Like, what is the actual problem? Is it all of it? Mm. I mean, if it's all of it, then we need to find ways of dealing with it and moving parts um, and dealing with the skills process um, issue, but also at the same time, building a generation of public civil servants um, that the state needs to really plow resources into doing that. I don't think that they're doing that. Um, yeah, so I don't know. There's a lot that I, I, but for me, the number one really is the skills skills audit and just revamping the criteria of being a public servant or civil servant. No, no, I like I like that one big reset. Uh, I'm actually working on something at the moment where mine is going a bit extreme. I believe there is need to have a license for you to be a politician because yeah. the job you do has got such ramifications. Yeah. that it's almost like driving a car and if we all need licenses properly <laughs> uh, surely there needs to be a license for you to become a politician but i yeah. do like what you're saying is it's a confluence of many issues but like i said the, the basics where people can see the state working for them because i do like the point you made earlier on that covid has sort of brought that it's either highlighted the weaknesses of certain states like south africa or shown look the the level of the ability of states to handle complexity like the Chinese or the Singaporean states or Asian states where they've really come to the fore. Other states like Europe have been a bit in between. And like even America is a good one where you would assume having all that money would allow you to have some level of a functioning state. But I mean, we saw even under Biden that there's been a bit of a slow rollout for many things. So I think you're right in saying maybe the big reset should be starting at just making sure people see that the state and government does work. I think that that's a, yeah. a very good point. Yeah. yeah, so give us some hope, Lisa. I mean, things you, you look forward to, like I said, things that give, that give you excitement, you know, when you wake up in the morning to say, you know what, these are big problems, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that uh, I don't have to immigrate to New Zealand or any of these countries where you, you will look a bit more, uh, different you know like when, when you go into the snow we, yeah. we kind of stick out <laughs> what am i hopeful for oh man what gives you that hope when you um, i can tell you what i'm excited to see unfold but that doesn't okay. say that it makes me hopeful i'm just excited to see it play out um i'm excited for the anc conference um just because i enjoy that kind of mess <laughs> Okay. I find it very interesting and I think people underestimate the how much you can glean from those kinds of processes um, and somebody that is interested in power politics and, and, and um, power contestations within political parties I, I find that very interesting it's just sad that that kind of thing also has very critical and most of the time detrimental, detri detrimental effects on us as the citizen. Uh, yeah. But I enjoy watching that unfold and watching that unravel. Um, I don't know, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm out of hope if I'm being honest with you, I, I, I really am. There's, there's, there's not much that, I, that, I'm, that I'm hopeful for. You know, when I was listening to the president's uh, State of the Nation address, I just felt, yeah, it didn't give me hope, you know? It didn't give me any sense that they know how to deal with what's happening um, and also how we are going to recover if we're going to recover at all. Mm -hmm. It just didn't give me that hope. Um, and even when I was listening to the budget, I... You know, you hear these numbers, whatever million, billion, whatever, being allocated to this and that, but you also know two weeks from now, there'll be some inquiry or something about somebody stealing those very funds that were allocated. Do you know what I'm saying? So mm. it's, it's just, it's very, very sad because South Africa, had, South Africa had the chance to be fundamentally different, not because of exceptionalism, because 
but because it had seen how everything else had gone wrong. Sure. You know, they have, or rather we had the, the benefit of other countries' experiences um, and how things got wrong so quickly. And we were, if we were serious enough in learning from those lessons, I don't think we'd be here um, and we'd be dealing with something fundamentally different. Um, but I don't think we learned those those lessons, and now we're we're heading down that 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 African con- post colonial condition. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I'm also I'm thankful that the key institutions that are meant to work are working. So the fact that elections are regular, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I think that is something to be thankful for, you know, and mm. that election ir- irregularities are few and far between. That we can still trust the process of democracy and not necessarily the failed outcomes of our democracy, but we can still trust the process of democracy. And I think for people, that is something that they are still holding on to that at the end of the day, I can still vote and my vote is taken seriously and that it's not rigged, it's not manipulated, it's not all sorts of things. And so I think I'm hopeful that those kinds of institutions, work. I'm hopeful and I'm thankful that people can still receive their grants if anything, <laughs> if every month that happens and it happens on time, I am happy for that because without that, a lot of people would just would, would just not be well and a lot of things would go wrong for them. Um, and so those are the two things that, I, that I'm happy that they still work. Yeah, I think you, 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 you sound like you're giving more hope, more hope. <laughs> but I think we, we move from the macro to you as in, uh, what does a year hold? What, what projects are you working on? Anything of interest which is sparking your authorship or to, 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 to consider? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm hoping to write more this year um, academically around these kinds of topics. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to do that. I'm hoping to, yeah, I think that's all I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting to do this year to prioritize that kind of writing. Um, and to also to write more, to write more thing, to write things, sorry, that are not in the shelves of academia, you know, mm-hmm. like to do a lot more public facing work um, and to do more. And, and, and to, cause, cause my problem is that a lot of kind of this kinds of these conversations are in the silos of ac- academic institutions or um, within centers or democratic centers and all of that stuff that aren't necessarily the generalized kinds of conversation. Sure. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm wanting to do more of that kind of work this year. Um, so if you do see me on TV, give me a shout out. <laughs> um, so that kind of stuff. Uh, and also doing it in more, in more non-stream um, media houses, you know, um, cause I think, yeah, we may not have that conversation, but yeah, being a bit more non-mainstream, um, but yeah, and maybe commenting more, being more in the commentary space this year as well. Um, yeah, those are my sort of highlights for the year. No, no, no. Thank you so much Lisa, for that. And, uh, so what's your, since you are a, and what you call it, you're in the know with all these social media things. What's your Twitter handle, LinkedIn, and everything else? My LinkedIn is Lisa Mobozi. My Twitter is at Mobozi Lise. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Those are my only two. Oh, but you said you do Instagram. Don't lie to us now. Yeah, but Instagram is like private. You know what I mean? Ah. Like for people that you know, it's not for you know mass consumption. Yeah, so my LinkedIn, yeah, and my, yeah, I'm LinkedIn almost everywhere. Okay, you're everywhere. No, thank you so much, Lita. Just uh, first, I think, yeah, insightful. Uh, Nate's one ponder. Uh, I know you said that you might be a bit of out of hope, but I always say, look, you, you're kind of like the bit of the living hope that you can come from a certain place in the Eastern Cape and to beat the odds. You're right in saying that it, we'd like this to be more of the norm rather than that. Yeah a bit of the aberration, but I think you kind of do give hope to those people. So look, it is possible. So thank you so much, actually, indulging us, uh, giving us your rich commentary. And yeah, thank you very much, Lisa.
Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, anytime. All right. And that's TK Show uh, with uh, a guest author, maverick analyst, and uh, hope giver in a different way. Miss uh, Lishle Ngawazi. And yeah, look forward to sitting with our next guest for the next show uh, in the next month to come. And please do look Lisha up, do buy her book. Those royalties are needed. And yeah, please don't be silent. I think that's a key lesson which we took from Lisha, just the issue of don't be silent. And uh, it, silence doesn't help anyone. And uh, we sort of do need to be the change. It's a bit too big to leave to the big political parties. And we do need to play a bigger role. So thank you, Lisha. And uh, yeah, to all those who are listening, uh, next time then. Ciao, ciao.